welcome everyone to a new semester and a new year of Lancaster University China Center events. My name is Andrew Chubb. I'm the acting director of the center. I'm a British Academy postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Politics, Philosophy and Religion at Lancaster University. Um, now, just very quickly on the housekeeping side, I need to make sure everyone's aware that the event is being recorded. And then secondly, that you're welcome to pose your questions for Peter, uh, today's guest, in the Q&A, or in fact, I think it's actually the meeting chat uh, in this webinar format. So feel free to post questions uh, anytime you like, and I will put those to Peter uh, once he's made his presentation. Now, uh, speaking of Peter, uh, our guest today, uh, Peter Martin, I'm very delighted to be welcoming uh, him as our first speaker in this year's seminar series. Um, Peter is a political reporter for Bloomberg, who uh, China watchers would all be very familiar with. Uh, he's written extensively on escalating tensions in the US-China relationship. Uh, I believe you're now in based in the US. Is that right, Peter? Yes. Um, and, uh, and he's reported from uh, China's border regions, North Korea, uh, from the far western region of Xinjiang. Uh, and besides being one of the sharpest reporters in Beijing over a prolonged period, uh, he's written pieces for foreign affairs, for the national interest, The Guardian, um, The China Brief of the Jamestown Foundation, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, basically all the big outlets for China uh, analysis or analysis of China's foreign relations in particular. He's got degrees from Oxford University, uh, whose press has published this fantastic book that he's going to be talking about today, um, as well as Peking University and the LSE. So uh, this book, China's, uh, China's Civilian Army, um, really opens up this puzzle that's animating a lot of analysis of China's foreign relations today, this puzzle of China's wolf warrior diplomacy, um, really puts it in historical context, showing that it's not that new and really draws on a, a large untapped reservoir of memoirs uh, that really humanize the experience of working in the system of China's uh, foreign or well, China's the, the system of uh, China's diplomatic service. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Peter, who's going to talk for about 25 minutes introducing this fantastic book. Uh, and then depending on the number of questions that have already come through in the Q&A, uh, I may pose a few questions of my own to Peter. Uh, and then I believe in the webinar format, you also as the audience uh, have the ability to chime in um, and, uh, and pose your questions directly to Peter. Um, you might just need to raise your hand and flag up that you need me to grant those privileges if you wanna come in directly and have a conversation uh, with Peter. So uh, with that, I will hand over and uh, Peter, the floor is yours. Thanks so much for hosting me. Um, this is a, yeah, this is a real, this is a real pleasure. Brief um, so that, so that we have plenty of time for, for Q and A and some back and forth. And I'd love to hear all of the perspectives um, that you guys have as well. Um, so I, I thought I'd, I'd talk a little bit at the outset about um, how I came to write the book, um, and then we can kind of get into some of the the, the key findings. Um, and I, I guess the starting point was that I had been, um, you know, I'd, I'd lived in China on and off um, from 2008 onwards, but had been away for um, a few years. So I, I, when I, I arrived back in, um, early 2017 after stints in um, India and then in, in, in Washington, DC. And, um, you know, when I, when I arrived back in Beijing in that period, it was, it was clear that um, China was making this extraordinary progress in terms of um, advancing its hard power. You know, um, its, its economy was, was beating estimates in, in early 2017. It, um, Xi Jinping was rolling out the, Belt and Road Initiative across the world. China was opening its first over or on the cusp of opening its first overseas military base in Djibouti, um, militarizing artificial islands in the South China Sea. You know the list goes on and on. Um, 
and and I guess perhaps most importantly, Xi Jinping um, faced this extraordinary opportunity posed by the Trump administration, um, which was busy picking fights with foreign leaders and, you know, criticizing multilateral organizations. And it was this kind of leadership vacuum that seemed to be there for the taking. Um, but, but what was extraordinary watching this unfold as a, as a reporter in Beijing was just, was the extent to which China struggled to step up and fill that leadership vacuum, you know, and not, not for, uh, lack of trying, Xi Jinping did give a very well received speech at, at Davos in January, 2017. And there, there was an effort to kind of step into that fray, but, but it became clear that China was very good at offering economic inducements um, and it was very good at using kind of the coercive side of its um, its foreign policy apparatus, um, targeted sanctions and just, you know, military uh, in, or in, incursions using its maritime militia and all, all of those kind of things. But it wasn't very good at this kind of persuasive piece. Um, and when you when you kind of step back and think about the kind of world that we're moving into, um, where you know U S power and U S preponderance is slowly waning, and we're going to have a world with multiple centers of influence, um, the ability to persuade others, um, the ability to actually win others over to your opinion, um, is going to be increasingly important, um, and. Uh, you know, so so I kind of came to see Chinese diplomats as um, as a microcosm of, of China's broader struggle to step into that void, um, its broader struggle to communicate with the world. And and you know, when I would communicate with them on a, a personal level, I'd meet with them in Beijing, or I I talk to uh, foreign diplomats who who met with them regularly and had done so for decades. It was striking that. That on, on a personal level, Chinese diplomats can come across as suave, funny, sophisticated. They're often extremely well read, speak multiple foreign languages. They've studied at fancy universities overseas, many of them. Uh, but when they when they get up on the stage in the foreign ministry to speak, or when they sit down across the table from their foreign counterparts, they suddenly become very stilted. Um, sometimes quite ideological and, and as the years rolled on from 2017 through to 2021, they also became, uh, increasingly hostile, um, in their, in their behavior. Um, so I started to try to kind of dig into why that was. And, um, as Andrew said, I, I, I came in addition to doing interviews, I, I came across this, this set of memoirs. Um, you know, I, I knew that. Uh, a couple of former foreign ministers have written memoirs, um, Li Zhaoxing, Tang Jiaxuan, and um, Dai, Dai Bing Guo, uh, former head of the International Liaison Department, had written a memoir. So I started looking at those, um, and I um, quickly sort of discovered that, that there were actually more than a hundred of these books out there by former Chinese diplomats, and, and you know some of them were by foreign ministers and ambassadors, and, and some of them were just by cultural attaches and military attaches and, you know, pe people who didn't hold especially prominent published in this kind of period of relative openness um, between the early 90s and 2010, 2012 kind of period. Um, and then there's a, there's a sharp fall off in um, the number and the quality of books published after that. Um, but, and, 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 you know, they're, they're hard work and they're, they're pretty dense and, and, and honestly, they're, they're full of, you know, travel stories and then accounts of endless meetings followed by more meetings and more meetings after that. But if you, if you're patient with them and kind of are willing to, to mine them, they, they have these little details that illuminate what it was like to be on the front line of Chinese diplomacy. Um, so I kind of used that as my as my source base. Um, and, you know, when I when I started out, it was a pretty niche topic. Uh, 
But uh, if, if you watched any of the confirmation hearings on Capitol Hill um, earlier this year, or you've, you know, you've been looking out at, at media across the world, it, it becomes very clear that what is now known as wolf warrior diplomacy has kind of become a a, 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 a top concern of, of policymakers across the world when it comes to China's international behavior. Um, and you know, of course, we've seen Chinese diplomats storming out of meetings, shouting at foreign counterparts, um, telling foreign leaders to shut up on Twitter, and even spreading conspiracy theories about the origins of COVID-19. Um, but as, as Andrew said, like when, when you look at this collection of memoirs and the, the history of the foreign ministry, you realize that although the the phrase uh, wolf warrior diplomacy is is new, um, the the kind of behavior that it describes actually has roots that go back um, a very, very long way. So when the People's Republic of China was founded in, in 1949, um, the new country basically had no diplomats um, to speak of. Uh, most of the, the nationalist uh, foreign ministry had, had fled to Taiwan, and those few figures who had remained behind were considered too ideologically impure to become diplomats for the new China. Um, and, and so the, the new government faced this kind of paradoxical challenge. You know, on the one hand, it was led by a communist party whose existence had been threatened by, you know, hostile outsiders for decades had been forced to kind of work in this, this underground militaristic way um, just to ensure its survival, uh, was, was deeply paranoid about threats from the outside, whether that was, you know, uh, the, the new superpower, the, uh, the new anti-communist superpower, the United States, or whether it was a rival government on Taiwan, which which claimed um, to be the rightful ruler of China. Uh, so, so it had this kind of deeply paranoid side, but it also needed badly to communicate with the outside world and to win friends and build influence and persuade international society that um, that it was the legitimate ruler of, of China. Um, and, and to kind of square that circle, um, China's first foreign minister, Zhou Enlai, um, the PRC's first foreign minister, Zhou Enlai, came up with this idea that Chinese diplomats should should think and act like the People's Liberation Army in civilian clothing. In Chinese, it's Wen Zhang Jie Feng Jun, and the, his idea was that they should be like you know like the People's Liberation Army. They should be unfailingly loyal to the Communist Party. Uh, they should be disciplined to a fault and that they should display what he called a fighting spirit whenever China's interests were, were challenged. Um, and, and, and that kind of militaristic ethos that he laid out for, for Chinese diplomacy led to this set of um, you know, really quite distinctive behaviors, which um, you know, were visible in 1949, and many of which are still visible today. So Chinese diplomats will typically stick very closely to talking points, um, even when they can see very clearly that those talking points don't resonate with the people across the table from them in negotiations. They will move around in pairs um, using this, this buddy system to keep tabs on each other. Um, the, the, the Chinese for that is Aren Tongxing, two people walking together. Um, they will often shout at foreign counterparts when uh, th they feel cornered or they're worried that they won't look tough enough back home. And, and they'll take even the smallest of, of slights or uh, public criticisms as, you know, they'll, they'll sort of often elevate them into these major international incidents and issues. Um, and I, I, I think that that happens because they worry that they'll be judged as disloyal if they don't deliver. And so, that that kind of approach led to displays that we would now describe as wolf warrior diplomacy right from the very beginning. So Wu Xiuquan, who was this veteran revolutionary leader um, 
Uh, the guy had a, a bullet scar on his face. Um, he, he, he led a, a delegation to the United Nations in New York in 1950. Um, and, you know, he, he delivered this presentation, which uh, 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 honestly makes today's wolf warriors kind of look um, look like shrinking violets. And it, Time magazine described it at the time as two awful hours of rasping vituperation. Um, and in the decades following, um, Chinese diplomats, you know, shouted at foreign counterparts. They were during the Cultural Revolution. They were they were expelled from countries like Kenya and Indonesia. Um, they they were even the one one diplomat was even pictured wielding an axe um, on the streets of London. Um, so so there was that that kind of approach. But then at the same time, there was this other tendency which lived um, alongside it. And, and, and that tendency was a push to use that great discipline which Joe and Lai had, um, had encouraged in the foreign ministry and, 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 and kind of make it work toward charming the world and winning over global opinion. Um, so that was deployed to great effect in the mid 1950s um, in the Bandong conference when, uh, Joe and Lai uh, kind of set aside China's ideological talking points and China's talking points about Taiwan and just and focused on common ground with the developing world. And it was really the start of an extremely successful charm offensive um, across non-aligned countries um, in those early decades of the Cold War. Um, and, and we also saw it to great effect uh, in the aftermath of the Tiananmen massacre when Chinese diplomats launched this um, extraordinarily successful multi-decade charm offensive, which um, culminated, of course, in China's hosting of the 2008 Summer Olympics. And so I kind of think of, of Chinese diplomacy as having these two tendencies, which cycle in and out um, over time. Um, you know, one, one tendency is to charm the world. And the other tendency is to use wolf warrior tactics to kind of tell the world off. Um, and, and I guess since around 2008, we've seen quite a decisive lurch back toward um, the, the kind of combativeness and the, and the wolf warrior tactics. Um, and I, I think that comes from two things. I think, you know, on the one hand, it comes from this kind of new confidence that, that China has as a global actor. And I think on the other hand, it comes from uh, enduring insecurities, which, which stem ultimately from, from the way that its political system is, is structured. Um, so the, the, the new confidence started, I think, really in, in around 2008, as, as Chinese leaders looked at the, the very successful way that they responded to the global financial crisis compared with the kind of faltering and hesitant response of um, leaders in the United States and especially in Europe, um, which, which helped lead to uh, a couple of years of really quite assertive diplomacy on China's periphery. Um, but but that, that new confidence became especially apparent after Xi Jinping became Communist Party boss in late 2012. And, and under Xi, um, you know, China's political system has become uh, an, an increasingly sort of tense and, and, and even scary place. Um, you know, she launched uh, a sweeping anti-corruption campaign, which has punished more than 1.5 million officials. Um, he has uh, abolished presidential term limits. He's experimented with the use of re-education camps in um, far western China. Uh, he's focused on ideology at home, and, and many of his speeches um, belie a, a hostility to, to foreign influence in um, Chinese society and especially uh, in Chinese politics. And, and, and I think it's important to remember that when Chinese diplomats see these signals in domestic politics, they know exactly how to interpret them. Uh, over the years, Chinese diplomats have experienced multiple rounds of purges in the foreign ministry in which colleagues reported on each other. Uh, and of course, in the Cultural Revolution, uh, you know, Chinese ambassadors were even locked in cellars by their own diplomats. They were forced to 
clean toilets and, and some were beaten until they coughed up blood. Um, and, and in fact, large numbers of, of Chinese diplomats in that period were sent to re-education camps themselves in the Chinese countryside. Um, and so they know how high the stakes of, of Chinese politics can be, and they know what the price can be of getting on the wrong side of uh, the leadership. And so I think, you know, all of these factors kind of contributed to, to setting a new tone for Chinese diplomacy. Chinese diplomats began to kind of mimic the language that Xi Jinping was using um, about China moving closer to the center of the world stage, um, standing tall in the East, never tolerating bullying by foreign nations, never giving up one inch of territory, you know, all of these phrases that it, the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation, all of these phrases that, that she used to describe his political project came to influence a new uh, kind of assertive forthright style of, of diplomacy. Um, and, and, and that new tone really went into high gear after the outbreak of the coronavirus pandemic. So China was, you know, under attack for uh, its role in allegedly covering up the origins of the, the virus. Um, but it also felt like its, its model and its political system had been vindicated. And, you know, after all, China did manage to contain the spread of the, the virus after the initial outbreak. And, uh, you know, the, the United States and many governments across the West um, manifestly did not manage to do that. Um, and, and, and so it felt, you know, on the one hand under attack, but on the other hand, increasingly confident about its model of, of governance. And I think that, you know, the result was a series of outbursts across the world, um, which were, came to be labeled Wolforia diplomacy and, and were apparently cheered on by Xi Jinping, who even wrote a handwritten note to the foreign ministry's leadership, uh, calling for more fighting spirit in Chinese diplomacy. Um, and if, if, if one diplomat has kind of become the poster child for Wolf Warrior diplomacy, it's, it's Zhao Lijian, one of the current um, foreign ministry spokesmen. And, you know, Zhao was this kind of relatively obscure figure posted to China's embassy in Islamabad, who, who built up uh, very unusually at the time, he built up this this large following on Twitter, and he used it to pick a a public spat with former U.S. National Security Advisor Susan Rice, and that that incident kind of made him, um, you know, a, a, a kind of mini celebrity with Chinese online nationalists, and. Uh, extremely prominent inside the foreign ministry. And so he kind of rocketed to fame and was rewarded for that behavior by being promoted to foreign ministry spokesman, which was a, a job that didn't, you know, he, he didn't look like he was on a kind of public affairs track that would land him in that position, but, but he ended up being, uh, being appointed spokesman, which made him one of the most prominent faces, not just of the foreign ministry, but of the Chinese government writ large, you know, of China, China's efforts to communicate with the world. Um, and, and, you know, since then, um, Zhao has, of course, you know, Zhao has angered uh, Australia, uh, posting adopted image of um, Australian troops um, uh, 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 committing human rights abuses in Afghanistan. He, he, and most provocatively, he, he spread a conspiracy theory about the US Army um, initiating the coronavirus pandemic in, in Wuhan. Um, but, you know, Zhao has kind of been accompanied by a whole cast of characters um, who, who have pursued similar tactics, you know, prominently the, the, the recently departed um, Chinese ambassador to Sweden, Gui Tongyo, um, summoned, uh, was summoned to Sweden's foreign ministry 40 times in the space of two years as a result of his provocative outbreak, uh, outbursts. And when Swedish media asked him about his behavior, he said, for our friends, we have fine wine. And for our enemies, we have shotguns. Um, and, you know, it's, it's important to kind of step back and remember that not, not everyone in uh, the foreign ministry or in China's kind of diplomatic and foreign policy circles likes this behavior. 
um, Yuan Nansheng, who was previously China's consul general in San Francisco, has warned about the trend toward extreme nationalism um, in Chinese foreign policy and the, the risk of such tactics alienating others. And even Xi Jinping, in a, a set of remarks to uh, a Politburo study session uh, earlier this summer, um, talked about the need for China to cultivate a more lovable image abroad, which I think was at least a, a kind of modest recognition that Chinese diplomats have been uh, more frightening than, than lovable in recent years. But <clears throat> You know, as I said at the outset, the, anyone who's delved into the history of PRC diplomacy knows that um, the, 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 the fighting spirit to which we've become accustomed um, in the last few years um, has very, very deep roots uh, and goes back um, really to the, uh, to the very origins of the PRC. And I guess with that, um, why don't I pause and um, open it up to, to Andrew and anyone else who has questions. Sure. Thanks, Peter. That's that's a great overview um, and a good sort of entry point into the discussion. Um, I just abusing the uh, host's prerogative for a second. Um, somewhat predictably, I'd be really interested in your take on you. I mean, you, the book very clearly lays out the ways in which the system, China's domestic political system, and even some of the, you know, the particularities of how the foreign ministry has been set up, like the buddy system that you mentioned before, uh, so that people are always being watched by their colleagues, for example. Um, you've laid out really well how that system ends up determining people's behaviour in many cases. But what about the role of beliefs? In, uh, in, in explaining some of this behavior. I'm thinking here in particular of the idea that sort of Marxist, Leninist, historical materialist idea that, you know, the West, uh, the capitalist world is in an inexorable decline and that it's inevitable that socialism will triumph. And from that perspective, wouldn't it seem like a good idea to sort of go on the offensive, to try to finish off this, this kind of inexorably declining uh, opposing force. Um, to what extent do you think that ideological belief or, and even the role of other beliefs, perhaps nationalist beliefs to do with the China's victimhood at the hands of foreign imperialist powers in the past could explain some of this behavior versus those systemic domestic political incentives? How do you think about how do you think about those two? And what have, what have you found in, in your readings of the Chinese diplomats' memoirs? Yeah, it's, um, it's, it, it, it's, it's a great question. And I think, um, I, I do think ideology is very important. It's, di it's difficult often, you know, you're talking about this idea that the, the West is in um, kind of an inexorable decline it, it's difficult to separate that out from just raw perceptions of power as well, right? Like I think often Chinese recalibrations of China's foreign policy have been driven by um, uh, changing views of the way that they need to respond to the balance of power in the international system. Um, and, 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 and one of the things that I think has stopped a reset um, and kind of a recalibration in recent years is this idea that, that people like Rush Doshi have written about that, uh, as you say, the West is, is, is weakened and, you know, America in particular is in decline and therefore China doesn't need to recalibrate because the world will have to, um, to respond to that, 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 that basic fact. Um, but recalibrations have also been driven by, um, you know, policy priorities. And so and I guess you could see those as stemming from ideology as well, um, uh, to some extent. So, you know, in the aftermath of Tiananmen, China kind of took on this, this pariah status internationally, but Deng Xiaoping was very focused on his relatively pragmatic ideology of reform and opening up and believe that 
China needed international breathing space in order to pursue that. And, um, you know, therefore adopted this kind of very low key um, approach to, to diplomacy. And so I guess I see, I see power and I see policy preferences as, as very important. Um, and ideology, uh, yeah, to you know, to some extent, but I, but I think a, a lot flows from raw power. I find it, I find it quite hard to find too many consistent ideological threads with, with Chinese diplomats. But when you, when you, when you talk to them, there is this real sense that, um, you know, I, I remember having a discussion with a Chinese diplomat, um, a, a young Chinese diplomat in Beijing and, and asking him, what was it like to walk into a room now that China was strong? And he said, oh, you can feel it. You know, people treat you differently uh, in a way, you know, they, they would have looked down at you at one time, but now you walk in and you're from China and they respect the power that comes with that. Um, and so that, you know, it, 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 in a, in a, that, that I'm sure filters into the way that they, they behave. And, and I think you can see quite significant differences in terms of how China treats, uh, powerful countries when it comes to wolf warrior diplomacy, um, and, and, and weaker countries, you know, I think its behavior has been much more restrained with the United States because it views the United States still as the most powerful country in the world and much, uh, and, and and envoys have felt much more at liberty when it comes to picking fights with countries like Canada and France and Britain because they're not perceived as as powerful. Um, but I, I don't know. I'd be I'd be interested to, to to hear some of your thoughts as well on on the role of ideology. But especially in the recent behaviour, I find it I find it hard to to kind of isolate ideological beliefs apart from nationalism and and, and, and power. Yeah. That's actually a perfect segue to a question that's just come in in the chat from Baishu, who's a PhD student uh, in the centre here. Um, Baishu asks, the, the extent to which you think that China's rising nationalism, I think by which she probably means rising popular nationalism on, on the popular level among mm. citizens, has influenced or facilitated this formation of wolf warrior diplomacy. To what extent are they playing to a, a nationalist gallery uh, outside of the political system in China, do you think? Um, so, yeah, it's it's super important, um, and you know, we we know that um, from the nineteen nineties onwards, Chinese diplomats have been, um, you know, pretty avid consumers of online nationalist content, whether that's come from, you know, online. You know, uh, the, the, the kind of online forums that proliferated in the late 90s and early 2000s, um, the bulletin boards or um, from the from the you know nationalist newspapers like the Global Times and uh, and of course famously in the 2000s, the foreign ministry um, you know even received calcium tablets in the mail in a in a kind of uh, dig at them to suggest that they didn't have strong enough backbones. Um, and I think that that created um, this this constant worry that um, you know they they were viewed as you know, kind of traitors and too weak and selling out China's interests. Um, but but really, you know, the the foreign ministry at the time was was just was following the the tone that the, that China's top leadership had set for them. They weren't they weren't going rogue and pursuing that approach. They were they were following the foreign policy priorities of of Jiang Zemin and then and then Hu Jintao, um, and th there were other elites in the Chinese political system who didn't like that approach. And there, were, you know, there were a number of incidents reported in Hong Kong media of um, uh, people's figures in the People's Liberation Army calling for the resignation of Chen Qichen, the foreign minister in the in the nineties, for example, because they perceived him as as too weak. Um, and and now you know i've i've had conversations with chinese diplomats who continue to consume that content um they read extensively for example um when when uh, you know the rest of the world was concerned that china was being too assertive on its border and too aggressive on its border with india uh, chinese diplomats were reading online nationalists who were saying that china was being too weak and cowardly um and so certainly that stuff filters through 
Um, I think I think kind of what's changed under Xi Jinping is that whereas they they previously had cover from the top leadership and there was this distinction of like um, the expectations of those nationalists versus central government policies. Xi Jinping has has more or less adopted that nationalist platform as part of his, um, you know, his way of doing business. And um, if you look at the, you know, statements of, you know, some of his speeches and then the content of the Global Times, there's not there's not so much difference on a good day. And um, that that has made it really very difficult to 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 not follow that. The tone and, and so as a result i think the foreign ministry has also um kind of ad adopted that that nationalist brash tone and 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 so i i kind of see um xi jinping in some ways as the ultimate victory of the online nationalist because um their their platform is kind of now the platform of the central government interesting a kind of meeting of minds i remember an article <laughs> several years ago uh by professor Zhao sui sheng uh, which yeah. talked about the coming together of popular and official nationalism, which for quite some time had been operating on separate tracks. But sometime in the mid to late 2000s, the lines of thinking that China finally needed to sort of stand up and start start getting a little more in the face of these uppity foreigners who were sort of giving them lectures about how to run their economy and things like that, uh, that those lines of thinking actually started to converge from the late late uh, 2000s and that oh interesting the explanation for the end of china's charm offensive diplomacy um another question that i have actually is that uh, and i can see there's uh well, some typing going on in the chat um I'll, I'll just throw this question out there and then i'll move on to more questions from the audience sure. to what extent do you think this phenomenon of undiplomatic diplomacy is a uniquely chinese phenomenon versus mm -hmm. Uh, a phenomenon of, uh, of, of, say, authoritarian states or Marxist-Leninist states or maybe even authoritarian political figures. If we think of, you know, the Trump administration, some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, rhetoric coming out of um, out of uh, the State Department when uh, Donald Trump was in the White House. Um, do you see parallel examples of counterproductively strong rhetoric from diplomats of other countries? Um, um, and and if so, what what do you think sort of determines it? Uh, since China's sort of combination that you mentioned before of like insecurity plus new empowerment um, or 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 a favorable changes in the balance of power internationally would seem to be one of those things that's uh, perhaps unique to China. Um, or 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 do you see other examples of this of where where this has happened? It's a great question. It's not it's not something that I've looked at in, in great detail. So I can give you a bunch of kind of jumbled thoughts rather than a kind of um, neatly packaged, um, fully considered answer. Um, you know, that what immediately comes to mind is is the during the Cultural Revolution, when this brand of Chinese diplomacy was at its most extreme. Um, even that you know there are exchanges in the archives between um north korean and soviet diplomats who were just bewildered by the way that that their chinese counterparts were behaving and um had kind of never seen anything like it and, and, and really didn't understand it so there are definitely some examples where um chinese envoys seem to go further than even those systems would but my you know my instinct really in answering the question is that given that I see this behavior as stemming from institutions and given the fact that many of China's institutions when it comes to foreign policy are modeled on the Soviet Union. And I, I, I believe that North Koreans are too with many idiosyncrasies, then, then it, it, it shouldn't be a uniquely Chinese phenomenon. It should be something that kind of follows that, that system. So that's, that's my overall instinct, despite the the fact that um, there were these kind of extreme examples, which alarmed even even Kim Il Sung's North Korea. Um, the, the the kind of the, the other thing that that strikes me, and and this you know, I kind of think of the Trump administration in particular. The the, the Trump the Trump administration was um, 
its political appointees were acting in these kind of extreme ways and insulting foreign <laughs> leaders and being kind of wolf warriors themselves. But the US Foreign Service had a very distinctive ethos, you know, and, and, and diplomats saw themselves as serving the United States Constitution and an enduring interest which extended beyond any particular leader. And so it was very clear when they interacted with foreign counterparts, they, they do their best to package Trump administration messages in a way that was palatable to the rest of the world and kind of tone things down and stress continuity where they could while also doing their basic job of, of representing the elected government. And so, so I guess that in maybe in democracies writ large, but certainly in the United States, um, there's a tendency for professional diplomats to kind of pull things back towards a, a stable medium Whereas maybe in, in, in a system like China's, once the leadership manages to steer this formidable ship in a different direction, kind of the whole system um, runs along behind it. So th those are kind of some, some jumbled first thoughts there. Thanks, Peter. Um, now I've unmuted Xin Liu, who has the next question. Xin Liu from uh, UCLan, University of Central Lancashire. Um, feel free to jump in if you can, uh, Xin. Yes, thank you, Andrew. Can you hear me? I think I can. Yeah, thank you very much, Peter, for the fantastic uh, topic on this. Uh, yeah, the the, the book. Uh, I think my question was already half raised by Andrew while I was waiting for my turn to ask the question. Uh, so basically, I uh, think the wolf warrior wolf warrior uh, style was shaped by probably four potential factors. Uh, you've touched quite a few in your talk so far. For example, the number one I see would be the rise of China or more like the reju rejuvenation of Chinese nation, uh, according to the new China dream. Uh, and then the second factor is the, the new leadership of Xi Jinping, the, the change of, uh, uh, it was not that new, but that compared with uh, the rise of China that has been happening for a few decades. And in the last decade, we've got the new leadership and also the domestic uh, rising of uh, the nationalist sentiments, as you mentioned already, uh, some diplomats have to feel they have to act tough enough to gain, you know, fans back at home. Uh, on the other hand, and they just are kind of uh, kidnapped by that kind of sentiment. Uh, and the last factor I think was mentioned in Andrew's question is about the actually the Western response to China's behavior or rhetoric or change, because diplomacy in many ways is actually also reacting to what, like generally the reception and uh, reaction to the new China or to the stronger China. Um, as you mentioned, uh, said by Gui Songyou, the, the ambassador to Sweden, like uh, we have shotguns to friends, uh, sorry, to enemies, but if you're friends, we have one. So uh, similar things like China would never be the first one to, to be aggressive, to invade. Yeah, will not be the first one to behave very, you know, like hawkish or unfriendly. So to what way you think those four different factors actually are playing different roles in shaping the wolf warrior behavior, particularly the last one, to what way you think China is actually reacting to some unfriendly, um, I don't know, stance or some misunderstanding according to the Chinese side, some um, unfair accusations uh, according to the Chinese side. Thank you. Yeah, uh, terrific question. And, uh, you know, I think all four factors are important. And in, in my presentation, I kind of tried to uh, lay out the chronology in a way that, that didn't stress Xi Jinping too much, because I think that, you know, she, you know, on your first factor, she, she, she was crucial um, to to the rise of wolf warrior diplomacy, but but there were also there was also a whole constellation of of events in 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 China and in in you know globally that made Xi Jinping possible. Um, the the rise of domestic nationalism, um, the the newfound confidence after two thousand eight nine perceptions of Western decline, and 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 also you know in addition to that domestic events like the the response to the uh, the 2011 Arab Spring and the belief that uh, authoritarian states needed to kind of double down on repressive um, tactics at home in order to survive. All of those things created a 
uh, an intellectual climate in China's political elite that made Xi possible. So I, th those two things are very much intertwined, I think. Um, domestic nationalism, we've already um, kind of talked about a little bit. Um, that that was a force which Chinese diplomats were able to a large extent to um, kind of withstand during the, the Jiang and Hu eras. They were certainly mindful of it and intimidated by it, but they could they could withstand it as long as the leadership's opinion didn't change, which of course it did after 2008 and especially after 2012. In terms of the, the a response to the West, I think it's like the, your, your fourth factor, I think it's, it's kind of a mixed picture. Um, it's certainly clear to me that some of the most extreme um, language that, that that we label as wolf warrior diplomacy was a response to um, provocations. And I think in particular of the foreign ministry's response to former Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Um, I sat in those foreign ministry briefings um, as Pompeo was saying provocative things in Washington uh the, the foreign ministry responded with this just ex these extraordinary personal attacks uh i've never seen anything like it you know the only the only other figure i've really seen the foreign ministry speak about like that is the dalai lama you know just like personal insults and and it's all the more extraordinary when you think that um pompeo headed up an organization in the us which was the foreign ministry's primary interlocutor you know they were burning bridges and and also you know launching personal attacks on a potential republican contender for president you know and and i think the reason that they did that was because pompeo's rhetoric upset them in ways that other trump administration officials didn't because pompeo went after the ruling legitimacy of the communist party rather than just chinese industrial policies or or foreign policies um and, and, and so, you know, in response, I think we saw this huge escalation in the way that the foreign ministry behaved, because I think likely Chinese diplomats felt that if they didn't respond in that way, they might be seen as failing to protect the CCP's ruling legitimacy. And that's, you know, that's really the worst kind of offense that they could launch into. So absolutely. Uh, the response to Trump played uh, an important role. But there are, you know, there are other cases as where it's quite hard to see what exactly was the, you know, the huge threat. Like, you know, Chinese diplomats have always been jumpy about um, uh, the suggestion that, you know, Taiwan might gain independence or gain too much international space. But of course, in, in Fiji in 2020, Chinese diplomats engaged in a literal fist fight with Taiwanese diplomats and put one of them into a concussion because a, a cake had been inappropriately decorated at a at a reception that um, that was being held, and and it's hard for me to see in in that instance what merited what what great threat it was that merited such an extreme response. And I think in in that case, it's more likely that they were kind of responding to the to, to signals coming from Beijing than responding to real time changes to the you know the threat environment for china so so i i think it's mixed i think the western response exacerbated things but uh, i don't i don't think it's that alone if that if that makes sense time for probably just one last round of questions before we let peter go off to his day job uh and thanks again for uh being with us before work peter awesome. um Question from David Tyfield, who's a fellow of our centre and uh, also in the Lancaster, uh, the Lancaster Environment Centre. Um, what does this wolf warrior diplomacy phenomenon, and I'd tack on to that, the long history of it that you outline in your book, uh, mean for the possibility of China assuming a kind of global hegemony? Um, David's pointing out that hegemony has historically meant that element of global acceptance or acquiescence, active acquiescence, um, thinking here of the US in the mid 20th century, um, and, 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 and that, that idea of uh, active acquiescence overlaying that kind of hard power domination. So achieving that seems to be less and less likely for China. Um, 
uh, and, and and yet China's increasing domination um, seems like an inexorable process. So, so what, are, what are your thoughts on uh, what this wolf warrior phenomenon means for China's prospects of getting that active acquiescence globally that, that kind of underpins the idea of hegemony? And uh, yeah. just, just to oh, tack sorry. onto that very quickly, yeah, yeah. One, one further question uh, from, from Baishu as well. Uh, what are the what are the chances that China will actually pull back at some point its wolf warriors and uh, get them to sort of readopt that charm offensive strategy, which sort of ties in with the previous question as well uh, towards building uh, more of that kind of consensus based uh, rule by consent or getting people to go along with your hard power domination actively? All right. Um both very good questions. I guess um, on the hegemony question, um, I, I kind of see wolf warrior diplomacy as one factor which is at play in, in increasing the costs of China's rights, making it more difficult for China to achieve the kind of position that you um, that you described. Um, I, 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 you know, ultimately, um, I, I think that like China's ability to overcome its demographic challenges and to upgrade its economic model and all of these kind of things will be probably more important. Um, but 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 certainly to the extent to which it needs acquiescence from the world, I think wolf warrior diplomacy doesn't help. And it's especially problematic in combination with the broader policy choices that Xi Jinping has pursued. Um, so it's you know it's it's not just it's not just the way that policies are framed to the outside world through diplomats and propaganda. It's the policies themselves. You know, uh, China's industrial policies alienating Western businesses, global military establishments being alarmed by the behaviour of the PLA, human rights groups and members of parliament being upset by uh, China's human rights policies, crackdowns in Xinjiang and Hong Kong, and global political elites reassessing the nature of uh, and direction of Chinese politics, given the, the removal of institutional constraints by Xi Jinping. And, and so I think what wolf warrior diplomacy does is it takes worries about those policies and it kind of puts a human face on them and, and sharpens those concerns. There was a period where you know, I'm thinking particularly of that sort of 2008 to 10 period where China's policies were incredibly um, assertive, but then often, not always, but often the diplomacy that accompanied them was quite ameliorative and kind of said, oh, yeah, there's nothing to worry about here. That, you know, that's that's not that's manifestly not the case now. Um, Chinese diplomats will kind of defend the assertiveness. And, and so I, I think that that does make the acquiescence piece um, more challenging. Um, when it when it comes to reining in um, the tactics, I think it's there's a bit of a puzzle there because you know it's been clear for some time. If you look at global opinion polling, and you know, the, the, I mean, the simple fact that the, the, the Chinese ambassador to the UK is banned from the Parliament Building, and uh, the, the response of just political elites um, across the world to this kind of wolf warrior diplomacy. It's been clear for a long time that there is a significant backlash, and I think it's it's confused a lot of China watchers um, to see the lack of a recalibration. Um, I thought that um, I, there was a possibility that Xi Jinping's remarks in June might herald the start of a, a rethink, but you know, there, there's work going on at, at University College Dublin to kind of assess whether, for example, the, the, the content of Twitter accounts from Chinese diplomats has, has differed significantly um, in the in the months after that speech. And so it'll be interesting to see the results of that. But as far as I can tell, there hasn't been a, a significant shift in tone. And and I think the best way to explain it is this this piece that we've already kind of addressed in the discussion, assessments of Chinese power. I think there are a lot of people who believe that China simply doesn't need to adopt uh, softer tactics because its hard power will mean that the acquiescence will will follow eventually. And just before I left Beijing, I remember having a discussion with a Chinese diplomat who was kind of concerned at the direction things were moving in. And 
And he said, you know, that there is an increasingly powerful group of people in Beijing who feel like China doesn't need to doesn't need soft power because soft power is or doesn't 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 need to cultivate soft power because soft power is something you can buy. And and there is there are a lot of people in Beijing, I think, who who believe that, you know, Washington, the, the, the America's famous, the, the appeal of blue jeans and Hollywood and all of these things stemmed from U.S. power not from something inherent in the US system. I, I think that that's wrong, but I think it's quite a widely held um, belief and goes some way. Yeah, there you go, Andrew, the role of beliefs. But like, <laughs> but I, I, I do think that that's important in explaining why this recalibration hasn't happened. What, what I have expected for a long time and to some extent still expect is um, at least a a reduction in the amount of freelancing that Chinese diplomats do. You know, there were cases, and you know, I think of, of Zhao Lijian in particular spreading those early conspiracy theories about the US Army and the origins of COVID. Interviews I've done suggest that Zhao did that on his own. He didn't have permission from higher up in the system. And that's that's extraordinary if you think about it. You know, US uh, China's relationship with the United States is the most sensitive part of its foreign policy and has traditionally been the sole preserve of the kind of paramount leader to to set and uh here was a you know lowly um deputy dg level official uh making up the policy as he went along and 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 that seems to me something that's that's fundamentally at odds with the rest of the Xi Jinping project. Xi's political project is all about making sure that the rip of the Communist Party runs through every institution, whether it's an SOE or a, a government department or, or even a, a private company or a, you know, a part of civil society and, and, and making sure that within that party state system, his rip runs very large and um, his preferences are reflected. And so, you know, freelancing by deputy DG level officials seems to have absolutely no place in that project. And I, I have long expected and, and I think still expect uh, perhaps the, the tone of Chinese diplomacy won't change, but there will at least be more kind of central top down direction to it. But we'll have to wait and see if that if that comes true. Wait and see. Never a bad idea when it comes to analysing China. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Um, this was a terrific talk and thanks for sticking around to uh, answer our questions as well. Uh, I know you've got to get off to work. Um, so I'll wrap things up there and uh, just note for everybody in the Lancaster University community that uh, Peter's book will be available in ebook form from this evening uh, through the library catalogue. Um, and uh, and also just flag up that uh, this is the first in our series of seminars this term. Uh, next Thursday, we'll be having the artist Jing Wai uh, talking about her writing mother's project. So pivoting to the artistic side uh, from diplomacy. Uh, but uh, thanks again to Peter Martin uh, for being our guest today. And thanks to all the audience for your attention and your questions. Thank you and good afternoon. Thanks, Andrew. Thanks, everyone.